Hunter settled them onto a rock near the tide line and took for him from his leather backpack a thermos that was sleek and silver, like a slow-motion bullet. The steam smelled like Carly's grade school trips to Hudson Valley orchards, where the crispness of fall and possibility of hay rides and novelty of picking food from trees turned fruit into something exotic. She and Amber would sit on hay bales, their hands wrapped around styrofoam cups of cider and their mouths filling with a tangy sweetness that made Carly's head rush. She'd imagined alcohol would make her feel like that, or blood. At the time she'd been into this show, Undead High, about vampire kids who wore gothic clothes and didn't have curfews, and had thought about becoming a vampire at least as often as becoming an adult. Inhaling the scents of burning wood and fallen apples, she was sure that getting bitten or growing up meant living forever in a feeling you chose. Hunter raised the cup to her lips. She sipped as he tilted it, moving together like they used to. In the moment she formed the words used to in her head, he angled it too steeply. Cider dribbled down her chin. As she rubbed in her coat and he patted her face with a handkerchief, she longed for him to lick the juice from her neck. An ache mixed up with knowing that she'd never go apple picking again because really she was too old for it. The way she was too old for touch tanks or petting zoos or choosing a pumpkin from a bunch laid out in tall grass to make kids think they've chosen something when really they haven't. And all of this everything made her desperate to cry and desperate to kiss him and desperate. She stared out at where the sand met the Long Island Sound, waiting for something to break their sticky silence. This is where you live, her teachers used to say when they took her class here for field trips, as if they could ever forget they were on an island, a place with edges, as if they might one day get up and walk right past the shore. In second grade, she'd sat cross-legged drawing pictures of what she saw, goals, ducks and sandpipers, a confetti of shells, broken pilings covered with algae and barnacles rising from the water like crooked teeth. In fourth grade, she'd written reports on ghost crabs and moon snails and egrets and ospreys. In sixth, the year before Hunter moved to Fox Glen, and the last time kids were allowed to move around and touch things on field trips instead of being told to act their age, she'd gone out on a boat and netted bluefish and blackfish and baby flounders whose eyes yet hadn't yet joined each other on the same side of their bodies. Something blue-black dropped from the sky. The gull shrieked as it dove for its muscle. She'd worn a puffy orange life vest. She'd run her fingers over clams and eelgrass. She'd watched the guide hold up a live horseshoe crab, which wasn't a crab at all, but a marine spider whose knot shell was just a skin it left on the shore when it outgrew it. Behold, the guide had said before tossing it back, the oldest living fossil. She'd had a teacher that fall who didn't last through winter, a teary woman who was always cleaning her glasses with the hem of her skirt, and who'd made kids say the things that used to live in shells had passed away instead of died. Hunter handed, Carly handed the cup to Hunter. He shook his head and took out a second one. We always share, H. We need to talk about your feelings. He scraped the toe of his loafer into the sand. My feelings about sex, about me. You finger fucked my best friend one night and made love to someone I hate the next. What do you think I feel about your disgusting sex life? What I meant mean is I understand you're having them, Carly. Feelings, sexual feelings, which are normal, very normal, but which to talk about are rather awkward. Awkward was her mother, Gretchen, laying out tampons and pads on Carly's bed and arranging them into rows and columns, a bingo board of feminine protection, while she explained in monotone Carly's womanly options without looking at her. Carly had been 10 and already school-informed. Gretchen had been ashen and double-dosing the Percocet and whispering, there can be a smell. Discussing Carly's sexual feelings for Hunter with Hunter was an undiscovered consonant past awkward. A place overrun by flesh-eating monkeys who sucked on your intestines while you were still alive. For a long time, people have been trying to get through to me about how we act, Carly, the way I let us act, the back rubs, the lying around together, the co-sleeping. It's selfish of me. It's not fair to you. 
don't I decide what's fair to me? What you want, what you're hoping for, it's not right to give you that hope. We go around acting like we're married, but Carly, we're not even a couple, and we won't be. In her head, she formed gorgeous long paragraphs of breathtaking sentences that explained exactly how wrong he was about her feelings for him, which were nuanced and not at all needy or clingy or an urge away from humping his leg. I'm losing weight, Ten, two pounds last week. Only after the words left her mouth did she remember that he had read what the, read the personal trainer's assessment, 57 pounds overweight, that her mother had taped to her bedroom mirror. You should be with pretty girls. It would be a waste. But Hunter, maybe someday it'll turn out underneath this. Me. She couldn't stop saying things she didn't exactly mean, none of the words matching what was in her head. We don't know, you know. Underneath, I could maybe be beautiful. The wind blew his hair into his eyes. In the seconds before he raked it away, he could maybe want her. Sometimes in bed, she ran her fingers over her stomach, pretending her hand was someone else's hand, trying to separate the feeling of stomach on fingers from fingers on stomach, and telling herself they were the fingers of a blind person, the kind who's been blind since birth and couldn't match the shape of a person to a picture in his head. She told herself blind fingertips could think her belly was velvet and fur, textures that let you in. Hunter took her hand in his but didn't squeeze it, his grip like a blank piece of paper you'd expect it to be a note. Why we can't work, Carly, it's, it's not what you're thinking. To feel turned on, he breathed deep. Let's take Violet. You already have. You know who Violet thinks she's sleeping with? The guy I see in the mirror, the not-me guy with the face and the charm and the confidence, and when I sleep with girls like her, people who believe I'm him, I lose myself in being him. To be blunt, it turns me on. He blushed, shrugged, looked away from her at the water. But you know me, see? And you can't unknow me. My ugly truths, my pettiness, my cowardice. He turned back to her and kissed her forehead. I'm not turned on by being me. And I can't be anyone but me with you. In his eyes, she saw how badly he wanted to believe this lie. He wanted to be someone out of a book, a self-hating prince who didn't notice the fat ship was fat. A prince in Prada shoes and a Patek Philippe watch and a $500 haircut who didn't care that she had the shape of a profiterole and the muscle tone of pate. You needed to be able to live with the you in your head. They sat still as shells. The air was salty with the ocean she couldn't see beyond the Long Island Sound. The wind was louder than their breath. She stared at the runnels in the sand, paths water had taken back to its body as the tide pulled away. Thank you.